Dr. Andrew Dobo, welcome back to the Art and Science of the MDR, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to talk about EMDR and Jung, and always happy to talk to you. Yeah, so Andy, today we are talking about a story that we see it reversed. I couldn't figure out how to reverse my camera, but today we're talking about there your new book. Yeah. Your, your new book, The Hero's Journey, Integrating Jungian Psychology and EMDR Therapy. So I wanted to ask you, for those who don't know you, how, who, who are you, Dr. Gobo, and how did you come up with this integration of EMDR and Jungian psychology? Um, I became, got interested in Jung when I was like 22 years old. And mm -hmm. then I sort of had access to some Jungian guys when I was a kid. My uh, best friend from school went to Notre Dame and I was in Chicago studying music. And he took this course with Morton Kelsey and Morton Kelsey is a famous author and Jungian analyst. He was a guest lecturer at Notre Dame. My friend John is a really bright guy. He got to be friends with Morton. He ended up editing some of his books and he says, hey, we should analyze work with our dreams and Morton will help us and uh, it's a bit of a long story I sort of resisted initially like I didn't really want to work with my dreams I was studying music and I already I already was confused about my life I didn't need my dreams at night to tell me yeah you're kind of a mess you know mm -hmm. so I resisted uh, but what happens when you resist uh, there's this a Jungian idea that um, if if you kind of follow your true path, you're not avoiding, then your unconscious isn't is an ally and it will help. It'll assist. A lot of times we don't pay attention because we don't pay attention to our dreams and we don't have access to the unconscious because we're not really paying attention, but it's there to help. And if you resist, it will become an adversary and it will attack. And mm -hmm. I see that in my patients. I see that with patients. They end up with their pathology. I don't want to do this thing. And then they come back because the nightmares are worse. But the, the you know, pathology is worse. So for me, I was studying music. I couldn't even spell psychology at the time. I, I wasn't, you know, it was kind of a strange thing that I got invited into this world. And I resisted. And then I had the worst nightmare, the scariest nightmare of my life. And, and then I had it again. And after about the fourth night, I was afraid to go to sleep with without the lights on. And I called my friend. I said, Hey, I can't. He's the only one I knew who I knew knew anything about dreams. So I am these nightmares. What should I do? And he talks to Morton, like, tell him to write the nightmare down and the dream will, and the nightmare will stop. And I said, well, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. So I didn't do that. I didn't write it down. Like, thanks for nothing. And then I had the nightmare again. And then I wrote it down. And then the nightmare, I didn't have any more nightmares. And that's the first dream I ever recorded was that nightmare that was in 1978 I still have that notebook um, and that sort of started my interest in Jung so I've been kind of a Jungian my whole life even though I wasn't a psychologist my whole life but you know I was kind of got you know I was interested in this idea of individuation like what is that becoming who you're supposed to be how am I supposed to discover that so all these kind of interesting Jungian questions even though I was studying music those kind of things interest me as well. And so I was, you know, also I was in Chicago at the time, it was in the 70s. There's like a bookstore on every corner, used bookstores. It was a wonderful time, you know, for me. So that I sort of got kind of sucked into this uh, Jungian thinking as a young man. You know? Uh, yeah, so, you know, I, I've, I've sort of lived this book, uh, you know, it's sort of, there's, it talks, you know, how uh, about art. So I was a musician, like I said, and there's a lot of similarities, I think, with like uh, being an improvising musician, you're like, you're living in the moment, like beat by beat, you're like in the moment kind of thing. And so I, I tend to bring that to EMDR. So I, I don't think... I just like the theme of my book is just wait, watch, and listen. That's what we need to do as EMDR therapists. Quit thinking, quit worrying about the interweave. Should I do IPS? Should I do you guys? Just watch. Yeah. Wait, watch and listen. And what you need will show up if you can stop thinking. 
So that's yeah, I want I want to I want to get to that in just a minute, uh, Andy, um, about all all these concepts. But I I want to go back to again that integration. So you explain about your Jungian background. Maybe you can talk about your EMDR training. You did it what two years ago? Was that two three years ago? You did Dude, your yeah. basic EMDR training. My basic? I did it. No, I'm years. just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, 19, you've, I, I've been doing this pretty late since 1998. I'm not one of the early guys, you know, but yeah, yeah, you're pretty early. Not, I'd say early, not, yeah. first, not uh, yeah. first generation, but no, um, first, no, I, like Zangwill was my guy, so he had to be second, third generation, right? Right, so okay, so you did your EMDR training, and how does how did you come up with it integrating these two approaches? Uh, well, like I said, I was uh, I read all these Jungian books when I was a musician, and then when I went to grad school as a psychologist, you can't even, they don't want to hear anything about Jung. They, no one cares about Jung. He's like, no, it's just another four-letter word. You go to graduate school. Uh, you know, so a lot of these ideas that I sort of lived that, I, that were profoundly important to me, um, I had to set aside. And then you sort of just, okay, I'm going to be a psychologist. I'm going to do what they expect me to do. And it wasn't really, it was probably maybe five years into private practice where I, I pulled out some of these old books that I was reading and I'm looking at these passages I underlined and I'm like, I say this to my clients. And now I look, I say this to my clients too. So that Jungian stuff sort of seeped out <laughs> into my private practice. And then, you know, once I realized, man, I'm sort of doing Jung, and I didn't even really realize it. And then EMDR yeah. really allows you to kind of do that, um, you know, because I mean, it doesn't get a lot of press, but it is a psychoanalytic process. It's psychoanalytic. She right. I saw that. She... Yeah, I saw that yeah. you you recently or in the book, you, you quoted Shapiro, right, that saying that. Uh, or did you quote Andrew? It was Andrew? You quote Andrew his, Leeds Andrew, in right. his book, the supervising book. Yeah, he yeah. says the Shapiro thought she was desensitizing a, an image, but she, but people wouldn't stay focused on the image. They, their mind started to wander, and then she realized, oh, this is important stuff that's processing. And then, okay, let's free associate, which which is a psychoanalytic instruction. So it's not yeah. like putting a, a square peg in a round hole. I mean, Jung right. fits like right in. Like we do inner child. That's active imagination. Jung did, did that. He discovered active imagination. The safe place. Use your imagination. Active. That's active. That's Jung. I mean, nobody. He doesn't get any nobody credit. Nobody says that. He was doing that in 1913. You know, right. using your imagination in an active way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so it's it's very Jungian. It's, you know. So right, nice so you see it. Thing. You see it as a very natural integration that Jungian psychology and EMDR therapy. Far more natural than all these other things that people are jamming into EMDR. <laughs> Let, let's, not into biased, the, let's, let's not get into that. Let's 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 not get into that. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, in your book, I think this is the first EMDR book that I've seen that referenced only one EMDR book, which is. Shapiro's third edition. Why is that? Well, because if you read an EMDR book, um, usually you go through the eight phases. If you need to learn about the eight phases, don't read this book because it's not in there. This is mm -hmm. really this is really a mythological way to view the transformational power of EMDR. So um you know, Joseph Campbell has these 12 steps of the hero. And if you work with a client, they go through those 12 steps. Mm -hmm. um, and then in my first book, I sort of stumbled upon these uh, six stages of transformation. There's six stages um, and people go go through them. Uh, and like just briefly, the first one is avoidance. Like that's what people do. They avoid coming to see therapists. They, you know, and uh, in mythologically, uh, the hero always refuses the call. They avoid the call. Um, and every myth, whenever the hero, 
you know, Luke Skywalker. Yeah, we're going to, you know, I, I know I want to go with you, but I got to like, I got these crops I got to deal with. Right. Or um, Jesus himself said, can this cup pass for me? That's refusing the call. And so our clients refuse the call. They avoid, they can come into our office and they want to do the work and then they don't tell us the thing. They tell us some things, but not the thing a lot of times. So even in sometimes when they're in our office, they're still avoiding. So avoidance is like the first step. So when people say, I don't want to do therapy. Okay, you're step one, stage one, yeah. you're avoiding. Okay, and you'll have the nightmare. It's coming for you. You know, if it's time, you'll get an invitation. And the invitation is usually something that's distressing. And then the surrender is the second thing. Okay, I, I feel so terrible. Please help me. I'll do anything, right? You surrender. And for right. MDR work, the client has to surrender to the process of EMDR. So they they surrender or it won't work, right? Um, or it'll work poorly. And then the we dismantle the old way, the old self. Um, so that's dismantling. And that would be, you know, we talk about a death and rebirth sequence. So this would be like the death of the old. Well, in fact, most of the time you it's I'd really tell my people that I train, you have to tell the client after is the first EMDR session, they might have vivid dreams or a nightmare because right. you're destroying this old self. So there's a dream with death and destruction. That's that's pretty predictable and it pretty much happens. In fact, I was just talking to one of my certi people that I certify and she they sent me this dream. So I'll just read the first few sentences. They did two EMDR sessions. Here's her dream. It was a nightmare. Like, so there's chaos in a massive storm ripping through the broken down buildings. There's so much rain and water everywhere. You know, I'm looking for my mom. I can't find it. So there's death and destruction in this dream. And that's an encouraging thing because we that means we're on the right track. We're destroying the old way. So that's the third transformational stage. The fourth is, and it and it and people don't prepare their clients enough for this because um, I've had people, you know, contact me and they feel terrible um, because their symptoms are resolved, but they feel terrible because they lost their identity. So they don't know who they are. And so that's a period, a period of chaos and confusion is, is going to happen. And when you lose your identity, it's required. Yeah. So, okay. So, so let's talk about chaos and confusion while we're on the topic, because I think yeah. this is, I really love that you talk about that. Uh, this is, I think, a a topic that you bring. You chaos and confusion is a Jungian term, but you bring it into EMDR, and it fits so well because chaos and confusion, like you say in the book, I think it's chapter ten. It's very predictable. We need to be ready for it. The client needs to be ready for it in order to do the work. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the process of chaos and confusion. Yeah, well, uh, one of Jung's quotes is, all psychological transformation requires a period of chaos and confusion. Because if you if you destroy the old way, and there's two transformational cognitions, which I don't know some of you may not, not know that, but it's I don't matter or I'm not good enough. Those are po more powerful cognitions than any other. And you got to right. be care careful with those. So if somebody doesn't matter, right, and you process that, and now they know that, man, people are taking advantage of me. I got to set some boundaries. I can't just do whatever anybody wants to do. So I have to do this new way. But they don't know how to do the new way. They have no idea how to do that. So they don't know how to do the new way. And they know they can't go back to the old way. So they are lost. And that's predictable. And it's a good sign. That means that old way is not, they're not going back there, but you have to help them figure out the new way. Um, and, and you really got to warn your client about that. One woman contacted, I wasn't her therapist, but she uh, contacted me on Facebook and she said, I'm so calm and content there's something wrong with me. I can't stand this. Like she would always freak out. She'd always be anxious all the time. And like she said, I went to this new job and I'm a waitress and I and this, I was there. It's my second day. And I dropped a whole tray of drinks. And normally I would just run out and never come back. But I just said, Hey, where's the broom? And she swept it up and she put this stuff away. And she said, I don't, and she felt so uncomfortable and she was complaining. Like this wasn't it. She didn't think this was 
was good. You know, and she said, so I didn't have to go get therapy. Like, what are you going to tell your clients? I mean, your therapist, I'm, I'm content and peaceful. And can you help me? Like, you know what I mean? So they yeah. need, there has to be sort of a warning um, of this loss of, and it's going to be more serious too, a vet beyond, a, you know, like a veteran who has PTSD and they've always been disabled. So after today, I'm not going to be disabled, be a non-veteran. Who am I, who am I going to be? You know? Right. So, so, and Shapiro gives a little bit of suggestion. They should go to family therapy or something, but it's, it, it's not um, in depth enough uh, because yeah. it's, a, it's, I think it's often the worst part of the process. You know, you do the trauma stuff. They know why they're upset. Now, why am I upset now? There's, I don't have any symptoms. What's wrong with me? You know? Yeah. No, that, I, I think that really helps to give context to all the chaos that often happens during session and between sessions while we're processing phase four. I think that a lot of people come out of basic training with a false perception that, you know, you're going to do this and we're going to desensitize, go to sub zero and, you know, everything's going to be rainbows and bunnies, you know, in, in, yeah. in a very quick way. And sometimes it happens, but most times it doesn't. And chaos and confusion is a good um, good yeah. way to conceptualize it. Well, I think a really visible example of what, what, ha what happens to your clients, though, but is Prince Harry. Right. So Prince Harry has gotten EMDR treatment. He said it saved his life. So Prince Harry is the archetypal redhead stepchild of I don't matter. My mm. brother matters. The queen matters. The monarchy right. matters. England matters. I'm a spare. That's the name of his book. Me, not so much. Right. So yeah. he gets EMDR and he can't do it anymore. I can't not matter anymore. I can't do this. Like, go stand over there and shut up. I, he can't do it anymore. So. He's if he's a he's in a period of loss of identity. He's in a period of chaos and confusion. Am I a prince? No, I don't know. Maybe you know. Well, are you a celebrity? Not sort of. I don't. You know, like he has no idea what he's doing. But he's the hero in in that story. Like he's gonna yeah. be. He's the hero. So and that's the price that somebody pays for authenticity. It's not easy. So I quote some really brilliant poets that talk about the price of, you know being an artist or, or being authentic and the price is often high um yeah. but the but, but the price of not being authentic is worse it's tragic right yeah yeah okay andy i want to um i want to present on the screen and read my favorite quote from your book uh so you say a highest highly skilled EMDR therapist knows the problem is far beyond overt sim the overt symptoms. I hope this book will encourage EMDR therapists to stop looking for the next new protocol that someone made up in their basement and will start looking within the self-healing power of EMDR, but by better understanding what's going on right in front of your eyes. Can you talk a, li a little bit about that? I, I love the piece about you know, protocol someone made up in their basement. But can we talk a little bit about why did you write that? Uh, because I, the, the standard protocol is so powerful. And, you know, if you integrate it with other models, it even gets more powerful. But with the Jungian thing, no one really even talks about this transformational, these six stages. Uh, and like Andrea, like they weren't thrilled about letting me do a course. I had to rewrite it and go get more research. They didn't, you know, there's more than two cognitions. I know there's more than two. I use the cognition list like everybody else. But right. these these two cognitions caused a transformational thing. And everybody might not want to do that. Um, right. So, I, you know, and the fact that I know that there's transformation that can happen during EMDR, but no one else seems to be aware of that, where they sort of stumble on it. Like, I don't know, Harry, I don't know who his therapist is, but I don't know if she prepared him for what's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, we do this, Harry, you're going to start to matter and you may leave your family because people leave their family. Because if you're married and you have an I don't matter cognition, that's your belief. 
you're going to find somebody to treat you like it don't matter because that's what you know. And that's where you're comfortable. And then you're going to get some EMDR. Now, I do matter. And what was I thinking? And now that person didn't sign up for you mattering, right? So, and that's all part of like the transformational work that uh, it's, it, a lot of folks aren't aware of it. And that's where really where the, this extraordinary power happens when you can get people to use the transformational cognitions and then go through those six steps that I was talking about, the rebirth thing. Um, so that that that's missing. So that's yeah. powerful. It's it's like it's like EMDR is like a 20 volt, you know, power. And if you do this transformational stuff, it turns it like into a lightning bolt. It changes people's transforms their lives. And the other piece is we think of thoughts, feelings, images, memories, and body sensations, right? I mean, that's what we're listening for. Okay, go with that or go with that. But but Jung, the Jungian lexicon, he identifies things that most people ignore. And they're far more powerful than any of those five things. And they're silly things that aren't that don't seem very remarkable on the surface because he understands that the unconscious language is uh, simple and overused. Uh, it's like a cliches are from the unconscious, like the body. We are we you know we're going to all this somatization. Yeah, but why the neck? Why why is it the neck not the back? So if somebody says, my neck's really starting to hurt, I just want to, who was anybody, who's a pain in your neck right now in your life? Who's a pain in, and they'll tell me. It's like the unconscious is an ally. It's trying to talk to us, right? And I'm listening. Right. And so like a cliche, like I, I like just recently, you, you work with somebody who had was in domestic violence. They got away and they used to have these panic attacks. And these panic attacks, what are you noticing? Yeah, I was just sitting at the, at the sink and it, like this panic attack for no reason, it came out of the blue. Oh, uh, I love to hear that out of the blue. Go with that. Uh, go with that. It came out of the blue. You know how many times a punch in the face comes, you know, after a woman in a domestic violence relationship, how often that comes out of the blue for no reason? About a thousand. And it just like rolls through that person's life. So that's an associated channel that, that nobody talks about. And that's like a Jungian lexicon this is the cliche about you know and it's the same as i'm not in control or i'm in danger but it it has a whole nother uh right you know, power so there's a list in the book and i there's some examples of a transcript and i isolate the jungian phrase and go with that shapiro says don't do that she's way out of line that's the most stupidest thing i've ever heard like <laughs> You just let the client talk, and then and then you say go with that. You could tell a monkey to do that. She's way she's wrong on that, and I can't even believe when I read that. Like, like what? Because I'm like I'm so I'm very present with the client. Like I just wait, watch, and I listen. They're saying this, this. Oh, there it is. Go with that, man. Go with blah blah blah, because that's going to open up a channel of generalization and these other like a body sensation oh, my chest is tight and but that thing came out of the blue the chest will be tight for the next three sets but out of the blue will be gone i'll miss it so it's really it's really refining your skill it's like ear training this new ear training for the clinician where you're really hearing things that you just you miss and so the, you don't need another protocol you just need to know like you've got to understand every phrase what has value what doesn't what's going to get me where i want to go what isn't that's why right. like when i was consultees you got to bring me tape if you don't want to videotape don't talk to me because yeah. i i could make you a brilliant emdr therapist we just need to watch some tape and i'll tell you you see why you missed that you see what that is and and another thing like people don't want to interrupt like People will like let somebody talk for three minutes. Mm -hmm. Like they'll say something like, well, I was in danger. And it did, it did, it did, it did. Yeah, I was really in danger. After three minutes, they say the same thing. Well, we could have just, I'm in danger. And that's three minutes could have been in their head, moving at the speed of thought, not talk. So if you do that 10 times, well, you just added 30 minutes to your session that is not necessary because you're you're not you're uneasy interrupting your client. You got to be you got to be able to interrupt. You got to warn them. This is different. I'm going to interrupt. It's not that I'm not interested, but if I hear some of value, I'm going to interrupt them and ask you to go with that. And that's what you're paying me for, because I know that's yeah. important and you don't. And, you know, sessions after people work with me, their sessions are rarely a half hour. Because we get in and out of phase four. We don't let these people just talk 
for no reason and go on and on and on. Um, during EMGR, we could talk before, we could talk after, but EMGR, it heals at the speed of thought. So you got to let them think and not talk. Yeah. And I, I had the pleasure of, of coming to Florida and teaching with you the basic training. And um, <laughs> yeah, I, I know that you emphasize that these do negative cognition. Um, I'm not good enough and I don't matter, uh, which are almost universal if not universal and i think it it makes a lot of sense um i want to transition yeah. to talking about the inner genius um that and how emdr therapists can access it you talk about it in the book about being the inner genius yeah well that, that's uh, uh michael mead uh wrote he has a book the myth of the, the inner genius myth and uh if you get it you should get if you're listening, that's a beautiful book. I mean, it is the most beautiful book I've read in a long time. Every paragraph is like a work of art. But yeah, he talks about, um, you know, this sort of developmental stages in a mythic way. And and really the inner genius, it's like we all are innately, we all innately have this inner genius within ourselves. It's not talking about your IQ. It's talking about the the gift that you have that maybe no one else possesses. Um, and you know, it's a bit of a journey to find that. Um, and, uh, you know, um, it's often got nothing to do with the MDR books. It's about the other books. It's about the other things that you're interested in. Um, like, um, as a musician, I, I mean, I, I'm also a fan of Pat Metheny. And, Pat is a, a brilliant musician, and he is maybe obsessed about being a great guitar player and composer. So he talks about how he he wanted to know, why am I really good on Tuesday, but Wednesday, I was not very good. And so he spent the last 40 years figuring that out, and he did figure it out. So they invited him to the Neuroscience Society uh, convent, conference in San Diego, and he talks about how he does that. And it's certainly, you have to know, uh, he talks, you have to know like all the regular jazz songs that people know, right? There's like a couple hundred. You got to know them all. You got to know them in every key. And you got to be able to play them in any style. So, and then once you do that, don't ever do that. Then now you're, mm -hmm. you can start. So after you've read all the EMDR books and you know all the eight phases and you know all the different models and you can do all that. And now you're in front of your client. Okay, now don't do that. You just wait watch and listen and mm. and any all those things that you know if you need it it'll show up as long as you're stopping your internal dialogue just like the client stops theirs and you'll have access to that um like i talk a story in my book and i i, I actually there's a video on on youtube that if you're interested with ryan you, yeah with ryan where he accesses the interweave, the ancient Chinese medicine interweave, right? So he didn't read about that in any EMDR book. Right. You know? And so uh, Methaney talks about this other thing. It's like units of human achievement. And the more units of human achievement you achieve, the better musician you are. And those units have nothing to do with music. It's about experiencing life. So Ryan's a yoga teacher, a surfer. He's a father. He's a son. He does meditation. He's a martial artist. Like, he's older. He's like almost 40. So he's done a lot of stuff. So he's got a lot of human achievement. And so he's sitting there having no idea how to get this guy to cry. Has no idea what he's doing. But he's just being, he's able to be present. He's not thinking. He's just watching. And he noticed this guy's heart, his breathing is like weird. And it's what's what with that read, breathing. And he's noticing the breathing. And, oh, I know something about breath. Uh, ancient Chinese medicine, uh, you hold on. They say you hold unresolved grief in the lungs. That's what he said. And the guy, for the first time in his life, wailed and cried by saying that like that's not in any book but that's accessing to his inner genius to just just wait and trust that what you need will show up because really uh emdr the, the protocol when it works it works fine but then really the most high valued skill i think of an emdr therapist is is your problem solving skills which means 
you've got to break some rules. You can't have this rigid idea that I cannot install the positive cognition until the suds is zero. What? If I if the I, if I can't get this suds to go down and it's an eight and I've been working on it for forty minutes, like I'm just going to try to positive thought. Let's see, maybe something will happen. You know, so I'm just problem solving. So yeah, so this idea, this rigid thinking, which is what I was talking about in that quote. That, yeah, the MDR didn't like work quite right. So let's make up some other thing. And no, it, it, yeah, you know, sometimes the answer isn't in an EMDR book. And, you know, right. which that's right. why there's no EMDR quotes in any, you know, any EMDR books. I'm trying to load you up with information for your units of human achievement that you may not read these books. I know you haven't read them. You know, um, unless you were hanging out with me, some of, you know, the books that I've read like 20 times. And every time I read them, there's something that I learned from these Jungian guys. So, and I don't think I've ever read a, 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 an EMDR book more than once. I, it's not like, let me read it again and again and again, unless I'm researching something. But these Whoa, books. Oh, Andy, maybe you can. Well, maybe your book, right? Your book. I'm, your book, I'm, your book. Just, kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, so, Andy, um, I can talk. For a long time about that I, I know you're talking about like the piece of art so bringing really artistic endeavors into MDR and just maintaining this creative energy you talk about flow uh, maybe you can talk about that really briefly and then we will have our community members turn their videos on and um, um, just ask you questions directly so let, let's talk a little bit about creative energy and flow yeah, so Flo uh, was uh, this Hungarian-American psychologist that came up with Flo. So he was a contemporary of B.F. Skinner. And Skinner, you know, people avoid pain and they seek pleasure and like that's it, right? And that was the Skinner's idea. And and this Mahali guy said, there's got to be more to that, uh, us than that. So Wait, what is Mihaly's uh, last name, Andy? Oh, I'm just yeah. kidding. You don't. I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in my book. Yeah. But yeah, it Nobody has like can six really consonants it. in it. I don't know how to say his last name. Yeah. So you have to check the book. And and, and yeah. his book, his book's really good too, Flow, um, the yeah. op op optimal um, human experience. Yeah. So, his, I mean, there, and there's, you know, uh, basic conditions for flow. One is, you have to, well, he followed these uh, Chicago artists around for like 20 of them. And, and, and they would paint and, and they wouldn't eat and, and they, and they wouldn't just, they didn't want any distractions. And they're like in this state that he called they're in flow. They're just, they're not getting paid or if they sell a painting, they might sell it. Maybe they won't. Um, but they, they just have to paint. So they sort of get lost in their work. Um, so the, one requirement is you have to be monofocused, right? And so we know when you do EMDR, if you get your client into that mindful state, that it's really flow. There, you you don't don't interrupt. That's why this interrupting, asking unnecessary questions, you're interrupting flow. So so the session is going to take longer because they have to get into flow. So once they're in flow, you can see them in flow. You can see them. And you want to keep them there. You don't want to ask questions. You know, if there's if there's no problem, don't don't be if you're curious, shame on you. Uh, just let let the flow do the work. So it has to be un, un, you know, not uninterrupted. The client it has to matter to the person like the person has to really care about this painting or the client really has to care about working on this thing in their life with EMDR. Um, and it can't be too easy and it can't be beyond their means so it's got to be a challenge so those are i mean there's more other things but those are the three basic things all three of those things are present when a client does emdr and also the therapist should be in flow you know so like i know i don't know people like write down stuff when people are doing EMDR. i i never wrote anything down zangle said don't you don't have to write anything down what are you going to write she's mad at her aunt why are you going to write that down okay Watch your client. That was the best advice. And when you just watch your client, you're just waiting, watching, listening to every granular thing going on. And, you know, and when people come and work with me, they got to 
flipboard in their lap or something. One person had a laptop in their lap. What what, what do you type? Get that. Just be, it's you and the client and you guys should be, nothing should be between you. Maybe, right. you know, you got, you got your little machine or something and just wait, watch and listen, you know? So, yeah. um, and that's sort of this idea of flow, not only the client, but also like Ryan was in flow, you know, he was present, not thinking, just waiting. He watched, he saw that thing about this guy's breathing. Somehow that connected something he read 10 years ago about ancient Chinese medicine and grief and boom, it just sort of pops into his mind, right? So if you're thinking, or if you're counting 30 seconds or something, if you're thinking, you're cut off from everything that you've ever known or experienced in your life. If you're not thinking and you're waiting, anything you've ever done, anything anybody ever said to you, any dream you ever had, you have access to all of that. But if you're just counting to 30, which I've had people say they do, you're cut off from your whole right. of the reservoir of your life, of you know? So that's, that's, you know, this. I think that's, I think that's, that's a huge lesson that I'm taking from your book that the therapist needs to be in flow. You can't, you know, that, that's why I never did this because I know that I, I know myself, if I do this, I'm going to start thinking, am I doing it right? Am I doing the right? Am I consistent with my speed? So I immediately just got the devices so I can be in. I didn't think about it in these terms in flow, but you know, after reading your book, it, it helps me conceptualize that I need to be in flow and I need to be kind of like in, in sync with my client. Yeah. All right. Um, Andy, I want to um, invite our community members to turn their videos on. Um, so I just want to say oh, Harris, thank sure. you one more time, Dr. Thank Andrew you. Dobo. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for writing a wonderful book. Thank you. It was a pleasure.